And in case you forgot, you did get the listing. Uh, he told the homeowner he was my manager. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. So again, Mike, thanks for setting this up. I love sharing. Uh, you've created this environment of collaboration, not just in your office, in the region, and now you're taking it to a bigger scale, right? So thank you for that. Thank you, Quinella, for making it a little harder. I have to follow you now. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't have the fancy slides and videos, sorry. You gonna sing? I'm gonna sing, no. Oh yeah, right, you have to watch that one. So a little bit about myself and, and what put me here today. Uh, it's been you know, a crazy journey. My dad moved us down to El Salvador, Central America, when I was nine years old. Uh, he wanted to take me away from Patterson, right? Uh, he had his reasons. And uh, it was quite an experience. A few months after we moved in, uh, war started. So we slept with like mattresses on the, on the, uh, on the windows and it was a pretty crazy experience. Went to a British Academy, went to school with the son of the president of the country, right? Uh, and I got to see both sides of, of this world, right? I saw the extreme rich in a country that had like museum artifacts in their homes when it should have been in, in a museum, right? But the country was that corrupt. And then, you know, we were nowhere near their level, right? And uh, we got to see the extreme poor. Right, and everybody that was happy with almost nothing, right? I remember one trip into the country, my brother uh, had like an RC car from the US, right? And uh, he comes back with like one of these coal irons with a string and he's pulling it in the dirt, right? And, and my dad is like, where's your car? I was like, oh, I traded. <laughs> I like this better, right? But I got that great experience. I thank my parents for that. I was always very independent, so I came every summer, I came to work in the US. Why? Because I wanted to buy my own stuff. I didn't want to have to ask my parents for anything. Um, so I did that for, you know, I got my working papers at 15. I worked every summer, went back to El Salvador and had like 10 times the amount of money because of the exchange, right? And had my nice clothes and all that. So always very independent. I went to college in El Salvador and, and at the age of 21, I decided to leave the country against my parents' will. Like my dad didn't want me to leave, right? Um, but I, I wanted that for myself, right? Something that I wanted to push myself to do something for myself. I was always very independent. And it was an experience, right? A lot of people don't know about this about me, but I worked at a cleaning company, at a mall. I worked at Wendy's, flipping burgers, right? But the one, one thing I can tell you is every employer, they they, they always hated that day that I gave my notice, right? Hey, I have to move on, right? And I remember Wendy's manager, you know, Carlos, he was like, dude, I'll give you a raise, I'll make you a manager. Like, what do you want to stay, right? But that is not to brag, it's more to, to really show you guys that you're in control of, of what you do, right? You are the biggest piece of the puzzle. I can speak till I'm blue, right? If you don't make anything of the content, Nothing's ever going to happen, right? So why prospecting? Mike mentions prospecting, objection handling. Uh, I was working at the mall from cleaning to Wendy's, same mall. <laughs> then uh, then uh, Nine West, Easy Spirit, for you ladies, I was the best shoe salesman. <laughs> I, used to, I used to fix, when you try those pumps on, I used to adjust them. <laughs> So they'd be comfortable. <laughs> I had my tools in the back. I'd soften the leather. Oh my God, Will, what did you do? Here? What did you do here? <laughs> so in that sales job, I met, I sold shoes to the manager of one of the uh, uh, directors at a cable company, right? And she's like, listen, Will, I love what you did. You know, here's my card. Call me on Monday. I know you're working, right? So she calls me and, and offers me a job in an inbound sales department for cable. So if you want cable, you just moved into Wayne, you call, I answer the phone, I take you from basic all the way to gold, right? Upsell you. <laughs> 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 you, 
No, I did not do that. What I did, yes, it would pay more money, but what I did is I would, I would try to internalize what they really needed because if I put them on the right package, I wouldn't get a charge back next month because if they downgraded, then I lost the whole commission, right? So started doing that, always very goal-oriented. From the day of my interview, I looked at the top of the chart and I was like, who's that lady? I wanna be right on top of her, right? And same thing, going back to having those goals like Mike talks about, right? It's very important to have those visuals. One month on the job, the guy I was training with puts one of his checks on my cubicle. Because inbound sales, you're in the office, right? He puts one of the checks, his checks on the cubicle. And the check after taxes was like 9,000, okay? And we're talking back in 2003. And I'm like, how the hell did you do that, right? What did you, what did you have to do to get that? Spoke to him, it's pretty much the same thing, cable sales, but it's in person. Door to door, cold prospecting, okay? Like, all right, let's go, right? I went to the manager that afternoon of that department and I told him I'm starting on Monday, so figure out where you're gonna put me, right? <laughs> And there's a reason I'm saying this, I promise. <laughs> uh, the first day in the field was rough, right? I was discovering what, what, it, what, what, what it took to knock on doors cold and maybe in an area you weren't as familiar with, right? Uh, and trying to sell cable to people that had cable illegally. Right, so imagine that. The black boxes. So, went to the first door. Hey, would you like cable? Cablevision, Will, this, that? No, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And go back to the office, no sales. I'm like, what the hell? What am I doing wrong? Like, this guy has 30 sales, 40 sales. How do I did not get not one? And I was like, well, they, you know, they have cable, most likely, right? So you have to change your approach. So next day I come back. Hi, it's Will with, with Cablevision back then. Your service is getting disconnected tomorrow. <laughs> I need to know if you want to keep it or not. Okay? I hear the kids crying in the background. Cable, family cable was whatever, $39. HBO was $11. So $50 a month, 52 something, right? That's the total for the package. Would you like to keep it? Yes, of course I need to keep it, right? That month, that first month at Cable, I broke the inbound, the direct sales record of sales. It's 119 sales, 107 connects, which is accounts that were installed, right? That started my career, uh, career Cablevision, 12-year career. I resigned the end of 2014 because they were selling the company to Altice, this French telecom, right? And they cut our comp. Compensation was like 50%. So I'm like, okay, time to, to, to change my, my path. But I had gotten my real estate license 10 years prior. And I was doing real estate part time while I was selling cable. And the reason I got my license was, you know, when I bought my first house at 23 years old, my first year working at this cable company, I really enjoyed the process, right? The home search, I was doing the search myself, my agent sucked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I had to do everything myself, right? And she taught me a lot of what not to do, right? Um, call her about this house in Nutley. Hey, I, want, I like the house. She calls me back. It's, it's not available anymore. Okay. I just saw the sign go up. It's not available anymore. Okay. I call uh, George Service Conklin. Some of you may know him. <laughs> he's been in the business for a while. And uh, he's like, yeah, the place is available. She hasn't called me. Okay, so I find out that the reason after, the reason she hadn't shown it is because of buyer broker comp. It's not available, it's not paying her enough money. <clears throat> so I went to George, I want the house, bought it, closed, everything was good, but I really enjoyed the process, right? So I would picture myself doing this one day, but it's not something that I needed to do at the time because I had a really high paying job. I got, had my paychecks every month, I had grown and enjoy, get to enjoy that job, right? I would work two to three hours a day, prime time, like five to eight, you know, and, and make a lot of money, right? So what did that, that job teach me, right? And every experience we've had is dealing with tough circumstances or situations, right? Imagine door knocking 
cold, no warm welcome, nothing, no, no leads, right? I mean, the lead would be the street, like here. Here's, <laughs> here's Governor Street in Patterson, right? But that was it, right? You have to come up with your own plan. And then take the peep out of the equation. Now you have the weather, right? It's freezing cold. So you have thermals under, and then you walk into this apartment building, and they have the heat blasting. So imagine that cold, hot, right? Uh, or those summer months when it was, it was extremely hot, and you're wearing a polo, and sometimes, you know, khakis, and, and you're wet. Like, you can see right through, right? Uh, I didn't wear white. Um, so that, I think, is really what set the stage for, like, the objection handling and the, and the like, the grit, what, you know, that, that not quitting ever, right? Just giving it your best effort, preparing yourself as best as you can. Um, obviously, everyone would like more listings, right? Um, and that's probably the most challenging thing to get right now, like Mike shared on the screen, less inventory, right? And there's reasons for that. Now, by show of hands, and, and Mike said he was going to do this before, but by show, show of hands, who has been in the business under, say, three years? Under three years. Okay, so most of you have been here for a little while. Good. Um, so there's a lot of things I'm going to discuss, but I, I want you to do one thing. I've been to many seminars, and I've taken pictures of every slide, and they're still on my phone somewhere. I never looked at them again. <laughs> right? One thing I'm going to ask you is pay attention, write stuff down, Okay, and then come up with a plan. Here's my, like he said, your power list. I call it a power list on our team, right? Those top five things you're gonna attack, attack this week and put on your schedule. Okay, I'm gonna do this one today, this one I'm gonna need a week and set that, that timeline, all that stuff and thank you because I'm learning here too and that's the whole point of collaborating, right? I may have a strength in, a, in handling this objection but maybe Ellen can handle that other one better, right? and then somebody's better at organization, everybody has their strength. And that's the beauty of team, right? Cobalt Banker team, anywhere, right? Um, so write down your toughest objections. Write down any questions you may have. At the end, I promise I want to make this interactive. I want you guys to ask. And if we, don't, if we run out of time, that QR code is my business card has my email, cell phone, personal cell phone, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, message me however you want. Um, so from my experience, what is, and to me personally, what, what measured success in a listing presentation, right? Many people focus on the brochure, you know, the, the, the materials in there, the collateral, you know, yes, that's a, that's a point of reference, I call it. That comparable sale is a point of reference. But what truly, in my eyes, measures the success of a listing appointment or presentation is how it will impact the customer's experience, right? Because everyone is unique, everyone's different. Some things are important to one person than are to the other, right? Is it price? Is it speed? Is it, you know, uh, just money or is there something more uh, that matters to them, right? Another big part of it is my experience, right? I wanna, I wanna be able to deliver something that is also pleasurable for me. Like I wanna enjoy doing my job. I wanna go and get another listing. I don't want an upset seller, right? I don't want a listing that doesn't sell because that doesn't get me paid and then now I have an irate customer, right? So what's best, what's the best to improve the customer experience What's the best to improve my experience? And that's how I structured my listing presentation, right? Everything that I talk about. So what do you talk about, right? You go meet a seller. What you should focus on, in my opinion, in my experience, it's what matters to them, right? Sometimes, you know, and, and you never know that the parents involved in the decision, you know, they speak to their, their, their dad at a barbecue. What influence are they under? Right? Clarify any concerns they may have. What are, what are, 
so, so what, what is your impression of this process, right? What are those conversations that you've been having for the last three months with your friends and family before even calling me, right? Expose those fears. What are those fears, those things that can come up? And I'm going to touch back on this because it's important. But what are those, one way I bring that up is, you know, most sellers' fears are, right, like these are the things that most people are afraid about, afraid of, right? Inform them of current trends. What's happening in the market right now with sellers? Demand, right? Rates, home inspection, contingencies, appraisals. Inform them of everything that's happening right now. This is what you're going to expect from the market right now if you were to place your home on the market today. Now, if you waited a month, now maybe competition's a little bit different, right? That, that home that's active now is under contract, no longer competition. These are things you have to own in your market, right? So be that source of knowledge, not just with the trends and giving them the confidence that you're a problem solver, right? Because that's what we all are. But also, making sure that you're leveraging all this information with a purpose, right? And the ultimate purpose is their experience. To keep it, keeping on trends, a few websites I'll mention, KCM, Keeping Current Matters, is always a good one. MBS Highway is more mortgage related, but it has a lot of real estate related content on there. Interest rates, keeping an eye on that. Leveraging relationships with a lender to be able to handle those, those fears, right? I involve my lending uh, partners with my real estate business. Why? Because they go hand in hand. What options do you have to help my seller in their situation, right? Is there some type of bridge loan, right? So the lender is key in improving that tool belt item, those tool belt items, right? Now, I'm going to give you kind of like a basic template, a basic overview. I'm going to give you some specifics under some scenarios, right? And then we're going to open it up to questions. But a general <clears throat> overview. There's three things I think that are very important to point out in a listing presentation, right? That you have to address. You have to paint that picture, that story. We're all storytellers. One is making sure that they understand the importance of preparation, right? I went to a listing. <laughs> And I, show, I showed the property, and the agent wanted feedback. And I was like, are you open-minded? <laughs> like, I'll give you feedback, but we have to go back to the day they called you for a listing appointment. Because I felt bad for that seller. OK? And she never called me back. Uh, <laughs> but preparation is important, right? And sometimes it can be intimidating. OK, so you budgeted for paint, but then hold on, this and that and that. We have tools here, right? Revitalize. There's a lot you can do. So preparation is important. When they feel that overwhelmed, you're here to solve the problem. Here's revitalize, right? Pricing. Pricing is huge in managing expectations. That's what you want to do because you want to improve the customer experience, right? So pricing. I get this question all the time for the team. Hey, is my number right? We're always going to come up with an opinion given those comparable sales. But what if that agent sucked? What if, what if they didn't make showings easy? What if they weren't prepared? Yes, it's a point of reference. Sorry, my glasses. Yes, it's a point of reference, but that all it, that's all it is. Yes, you know your market knowledge. You, ha you have the knowledge on specifics, neighborhoods. Sometimes a block makes a difference, right? But those comparable sales are a point of reference. I always make sure the client understands that pricing has one purpose, and that's driving traffic. Traffic through the door is what's going to determine the highest possible price. Right? You can have this number in your head, but if nobody comes to see the house, so I'm going to give you an example, and there's different price points, but a listing I took on 338 Union in Clifton, right? That's, uh, my opinion of value was, 475, we priced it at 500 on purpose because we knew the market was slowing down. We knew there was going to be less action. And if I priced the house at 469, 479, 489, 499, 500, it was still populating that search, right? 450 to 5. 
I thought, and I, I weighed this out, what is going to improve our odds if I price it at 500 to get a, a higher price or to price it at 450 and hope that we end up at, at 475, right? 450, 475. I couldn't guarantee that 25,000 overage. So I recommended, and I gave them the option, always let the homeowner make the decision. We're here to guide you. Given my experience, given my knowledge, this is what I would do. So she agreed, 500,000, no problem. As I anticipated, less action, less showings. And 11 days later, we get an offer of 490 with no appraisal waiver. So we all were familiar with appraisal waivers. I asked for it, she wouldn't give it, the client wouldn't give it, okay. We only have so much to choose from, right? And we accept. But I had that conversation with the seller before we accepted. Hey, remember my opinion of value. We have a 490, my opinion is 475. There may be an issue with an appraisal. Before the appraisal issue happened, remember customer experience. If, if you sell 490 and the appraisal short, now you look like you don't know what you're doing. Now it's a problem. Now they're upset at you. Now they're upset at the process. Now they hate realtors, <laughs> right? Manage expectations, right? Very important in customer experience. So appraisal comes in 460. I had already explained to her, there's a process, appraisal dispute, right? We're gonna say no, we're not reducing the price. And we go back and forth, appraisal dispute denied, 460 the value, okay, send me the appraisal. I, I look at the appraisal, I forward it over to my Eve Winter, and okay, so it's a, it's a four bedroom cape, but they have it listed as three bedroom. It's also listed on the tax records at X amount of square feet, and this is off, it's smaller, right? We send those comments back, nope, we're not changing anything. Okay, who's the bank? And it happens to be a bank that we have a relationship with. I called someone and be like, hey, can you have this appraisal look at this? Because sometimes it's egos, right? They don't want to admit that they were wrong. But when they get the call from someone and they know that it already got out, like now they do damage control. Appraisal came back for 90, right? <laughs> now, Obviously, I'm doing this because, not because of the commission difference between 460 and 490, right? I'm doing it because it's in the best interest of my client. And you go above it, this thing died. I'm cutting you off. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> this, this died. So I'm not doing it because of my personal gain. I'm doing it because it's in the best interest of that client, right? And if you keep that top of mind, you're always gonna win in any market because people see right through that, right? Second scenario was a house, and this is a different price point because I know there's different markets here. Montville, 172 Pinebrook Road in Montville. My opinion of value was 1,090,000. I recommend let's list it for 1.1. He's like, no, Will, I think we could do 1.15. Okay, no big deal, right? It's not like he's telling me one four. No problem, we list it, but also managing expectations, making sure that I do my best to, to, to protect myself and, and the integrity of our team and my lifestyle and my happiness, right? Managing his expectations. Offer comes in, too low, 900. Another offer comes in, like 850. The third offer comes in, hey, do you have offers? Yeah, multiple. <laughs> You guys love hearing that, right? <laughs> Obviously, we don't disclose offer amounts, regardless of the amount. So yeah, multiple offers. And then another agent calls me. Hey, I showed it. I'm interested. Yeah, I have an offer on the way, and I have multiples. So just listen. They're ready to make a decision. Just send me a, a, a strong offer, and we're looking to move forward. Make sure you look at appraisal terms, inspection terms. And this is in the slowdown. Now I have multiples, so I'm leveraging what I know, given the specific circumstances to my client's advantage. Right? One offer comes 1-1, one, one. the other one comes 1-3 one, wow. with an appraisal waiver. Wow. Appraisal 1-1, one, one. and I mailed the whole Montville with that one, 18% 18, 18 over appraised value. 
appraisal 1-1, one, one, sales price 1-3, right? But at every stage, I had the customer's interest top of mind, and I was preparing for something that could happen because you never know, right? Um, hold on one second. So preparation is pretty straightforward, right? If you're not sure about something, involve partners, a staging company, another maybe more seasoned agent in your office. Hey, can you come and see this with me? Don't say, hey, it's good, and it's not. Right? Leverage those relationships in the office, especially if you're newer. I don't care if you've been in the business a month or 40 years. You have a lot of resources to outperform. Just make sure that you leverage those. Pricing, pretty clear. Uh, making sure that we're pricing it right to get the amount of traffic. Right? And I make that clear with the client. The price is just to get people in the door. Let them walk in and have those feelings that you felt when you walked in here and make that times 20. Right? That's the goal. One thing I always use, and it depends on the property, actually no, it doesn't depend on the property, always, is, is some type of build up. I explain that to the customer also. Let's build up some traffic. Instead of doing showings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, five o'clock, dinner time, picks, kids' school pickup, right? It's about their experience also. Making showings easier for the client is, improves their experience. So no showings, we put in the system on Monday, no showings till Saturday. All day Saturday, go, go and show, showing time, right? Sunday, all day Sunday. I manage that expectation with the client. I'm helping not only get the most money, but also improve their experience. Is that valuable to a seller? If you have a plan that makes sense to them, is that gonna improve your chance of getting that listing? Hold on a second, <laughs> I like this. The other agent didn't say that. You're actually concerned about my kids and my dog and all that. That stuff matters, right? So build up another thing and think logically. If you're funneling all showings into two days, you're improving the likelihood of getting more than one offer at the same time because you're controlling the traffic, right? Um, obviously, all this extra traffic and more than one offer, right, on the way. <laughs> How many offers do you have? Oh, a few on the way. <laughs> what was that? Now I start texting and emailing people. Hey, can you text me back the response? So I have some type of evidence. Um, but um, you want leverage, right, in negotiations for your client. Same thing on the buyer end, but that's on the next panel, right? Um, so pretty straightforward pre preparation, pricing, build, some type of build-up campaign, and then obviously creating that sense of value, perception of perception of value, sense of urgency to give you that leverage in negotiations, right? Uh, experience matters. If you're newer, leverage another relationship. There's a lot of people in your, in your office, like I said, that would, would share. Just ask. Now, I'm going to give you a few tips on engaging specific type of sellers, right? And then we're open up to questions because I want you guys to give me what you have and what's stopping you from getting listings. Um, friends, family, referrals. Right? I want, if my brother calls me to sell his house, I don't want him to use me because I'm his brother. I want him to use me because I am the most capable, most resource, resourceful, uh, experienced agent, right? Uh, and I make that clear to every referral. I don't care who they are. You're not hiring me because you work with my wife. You're hiring me because you know I'm the best for the job. And these are the reasons. And I go over everything. I don't skip any turns, manage expectations. I want them to be happy. Why? Because if they're not, that'll spread like brush fire at the hospital, right? <laughs> so friends and family, a good tip for them in generating opportunities for a presentation is a CMA a day. You're not doing it with an intention of getting a listing that day. You're doing it with the intention of giving them value. So hey, just so you know, you have about 400000 in equity right now, given your current mortgage, right? Just putting information out there giving them an update. What are those trends? What's happening right now with the market? What are the things that your neighbor was talking about at the barbecue yesterday, yesterday which maybe he, that's not his specialty, right? Let me keep you up to date. Great source of referrals, great source of strengthening that relationship, which is what you want for long term. Um, for sale by owner expires. With for sale by owners, I, let, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about Zillow, 
but I, I leverage Zillow to my advantage. My Zillow spend is zero dollars, actually 79 for, I, have, well, I want to be premier agent, right? So it shows premier agent. So $79 in one zip code, zero Zillow spend, not one Zillow lead purchased, okay? But I leverage Zillow. You can search for sale by owners on Zillow. You can map them in your neighborhood. You're in the area, go knock on the door. Go make that first impression, right? Now know that they're getting hit by a ton of people. How do you rank? Answer that question. Out of 10 people that showed up, out of 100 people that called them, how do you rank? Would you list with yourself? Do you put them at an advantage over them trying to do it on their own? If not, you have to get to work and there's time, right? Just get better and better daily. So Zillow for for sale by owners, always try to get in there in front of them, right? They can't hang up the phone. They can't, uh, uh, well, they do curse. They do <laughs> They do slam doors, but it's less likely, right? I did that for a living. Um, a, no, a nice tip with, with for sale by owners is take a recording. Just, hey, do you mind if I, I record this? I want to share it with my team. I record it, share it with the team, record it, share it with the whole Maplewood office. Hey, guys, I just checked out this house in South Orange. By owner, does anybody have a buyer? 25% uh, referral fee. <laughs> Why not? Why not? What's that called, Eve? Percurring cause? What is it? Percurring cause. telling you to leave your money on the table. 30%. 30%. Okay. So you, sound, you sound like a fizzball, 4%. <laughs> um, another way to leverage sellers is, is open houses. I do, we do open houses and do a dual sided flyer and go door knock that whole neighborhood on Saturday. Neighbors only, open house. Let me show you how, what they did to prepare and what you can do to prepare and now you have time. I know you're not moving this month. You're moving in three years. Maybe you wanna redo your kitchen. What are the colors you wanna, what, what kind of finishes, right? That are gonna stand the test of time. And this is all free advice. Then you figure out a way to capture their information and add them into a database, right? And then nurture them. That's another good source of leads, but it's not instant gratification, right? You have to work to build this over time. Um, so obviously I shared a few tips, but what's most important here, and I said it at the beginning, is, is what you make of it, right? Uh, what can you offer that's different than what they're hearing on the phone every single time? All oh, Facebook ads and marketing and this and that. What are you doing that's different? Think about your superpower and leverage that to your advantage to put them at an advantage, right? Um, all right, so I put my QR code up there. Hopefully you can read it because I know it's bright, but if you have any questions, and I mean this, reach out. Text me, email me, call me. Just don't expect an answer within 30 seconds, right? Um, and I will respond to everyone, I always do. All right, so I want to open up for questions, if I may, and then any objections that you feel are like, damn, I wasn't able to overcome so, this. Before, I, I want to set the scene. I'm dead serious when I tell you this man is unbelievable at objection handling. So if you're dealing with an objection in your world, the seller says to you, like, commission issues, the competition issues, whatever, shout it out. Let him, let's, let's put him on the spot here. <laughs> Anybody? Go ahead. Uh -oh, here we go. I want a local agent first. I want a local agent interview. You want local agents. Okay. <laughs> so you're, you're prospecting where? I prospect every single <laughs> Where I can drive. Pennsylvania? Where I can drive. Okay. So, so I understand, you know, I under, so, so I understand you want to hire a local agent. Okay. I want to so, interview them first. I want to see the face. Of course. Of course. Now, when you, when you list a home, and this is part of the education part, sometimes we have to educate the client, right? When you list a home in the, in the MLS, I list a home in Cranford. Anyone with a pulse can list a home in Cranford. Every agent will see it. Every 
buyer will see it. They're looking in Cranford. That's something I call organic traffic. Organic because it doesn't matter who you hire or how the pictures look, they see it, they know about it. The local agent is valuable. They have knowledge, resources, all this, right? And we will involve them. I'm gonna put it out in the system, we're paying out 2.5% buyer broker, and they're working with all these local buyers, and they will bring a qualified buyer to your home. You're not losing that audience. Now, what do I bring to the table to bring an audience from other areas? That's my specialty. So you're hiring a marketing company to promote your home to audiences in other areas. People that are not looking in Cranford. And I'm going to steer traffic from Union to Cranford. I'm going to promote your home in other areas to get that additional traffic. So imagine involving the local audience, those local realtors, but combining it with strategic marketing to get your home in front of more people. Now, many people say they do this, but I'm going to show you why we do it. Not only am I increasing traffic to your property, I'm also generating leads for all our buyer agents on the team. How many people can you sign with? We're left with all the leads. So we're promoting, we're, we're promoting your home with the purpose of generating additional traffic, right? Now, that's one answer. Some of you may have a better one, right? But the answer was given the interactions that I've had in the past, given the location, right? I'm not going to get a listing in an area where I know I'm going to misrepresent the client. I happen to have sold over a thousand homes in, in all northern Jersey counties. I've sold a home in Harding when it was, I didn't even know where, where Harding was. <laughs> I didn't know they didn't have garbage pickup public, right? It's private. I didn't know that they didn't have a high school, that they went to Madison, right? I did not know this, but I learned this. That's not rocket science. That I know your neighbor's fr name because our kids go to school together is not going to make a significant impact to you getting more money for this house. Marketing is to the right audience, right? So funny because I'm going to share another story about that. And you guys could pull it up for those who want to. 102 and 104 Jenks Road in Harding. They gave one to me, new construction, because of my Facebook ads. And he gave one to the local boutique, no names. I sold mine in two weeks. It took him six months. And he's the local guy. What's the difference? Same house, new construction, same builder, next to each other. What was the difference? <laughs> What's up? So listen, and this was a little while back, but there's, there's a difference to what you can do if you truly have the resources to drive additional traffic, right? And that's up to each and every one of you, right? Yes, you have great resources with the MLS, with Colo Banker, with uh, cooperation and broker open houses and open houses and all these, this stuff that's standard. What are you doing to take that and take it to the next level? Open house, just regular open house or owner's neighbor's open house or a mega open house, right? There's a lot of things you can do to make it your own. You choose what you like. What do you prefer to do? What do you enjoy doing? And then push that because you're going to be better at it. And then leave some time to do those things that to get out of your comfort zone too, right? Because you do have to have those other sources too, even the ones that aren't as pleasant. We got a couple more minutes. What other questions do we have? You know the answer to this. I'll give you 2%. I don't want to talk about listing. Just bring me a buyer. So for sale by owner, obviously the biggest thing is they can do it on their own, right? So the, the biggest challenge with a FISBO is having them understand that you can put them at an advantage, that you can do a better job than they can on their own. And it's challenging because obviously they're not always as open-minded. Come again? Like, fine, fine, I understand you don't want seller representation. I'll bring a buyer and you'll pay me 4%. How do you get that? 
it, it depends. I mean, I've gotten, and, and, and what she's trying to get out of me, I guess. I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten on a for sale by owner without a listing, I've gotten 4% on a buyer transaction. Why? Because that's my fee. My fee is 4%. You could, you could pay me a 4% buyer broker fee, or you could pay me 6% to go all in and get the entire world in here. You decide. You decide if you want to limit your audience to my buyer, which is going to have an advantage over you because there's less traffic, if that's what you choose, or we can open up the floodgates. You decide. I can bring my buyer tomorrow on his own, or I can bring him to the open house and have them see 20 people in front of them. You make that decision. You know, my buyer, I will find them a home. Right? I'm never, yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm never going to jeopardize a transaction, right? I'm never going to hurt my client. And I mentioned that from the beginning, experience, right? Um, there is a specific budget that I have for for sale by owners that involves telemarketing, that involves ISAs, and it involves people going in person to preview properties. So there is a lot of cost involved. So if I generate an opportunity for a buyer, but there's additional expenses, I do make up for it. And it's earned. It's not, hey, the buyer gave me the address, and it's, no. I hunted three months for this property. I previewed 28 before just to find that one. Right, so it's a little bit different. It doesn't happen all the time, right? So it's something that if you have that buyer that will pay the buyer broker comp and is not open to listing, you took that video, you share it with your team, and maybe put one of your team members at an advantage, right? There's less action on that property. Can, can I just point something out? Sure. What was your volume last year as a team? Volume? <laughs> yeah. uh, one, 110 million. 110 million. How many people would love to have 110 million? Probably most people in this room. Yeah. <laughs> He's still working Fizbo's and Expires. Did you hear that? He's still working Fizbo's and Expires. So for the people that aren't doing a million, like, I think about that and I think, like, get to work. Like, go out there and build a skill set because just like what he said before, we started with the cable company and he said, all right, I want to go from inbound leads to outbound. Like, send me out because I knew there's a bigger paycheck attached. Well, clearly, at 110 million, he still knows there's a big paycheck attached to going after physical mm -hmm. supplier. It's a pretty good take. So, two things on that. One is, one, whatever it is, at a, at a 411 average sale price, right? That's a lot of units, right? A lot of practice. So our goals is improving average sale price. So how are we going to change the audience? Improving average sales price to improve overall volume, right? And something that's my personal goal, we went our, we've been in business what, eight years as a team, right, when I first started? And we went from zero to this year, what, 140, 150 million? But listen to this. This is my goal. My goal isn't the 150 million. My goal is getting out of production. So I went from 90% production down to 19%. 19% of the production is mine. The rest of the team. Wow. I want to go to zero. So that's... Yeah, full-time agents, 12, if that. Part-time? Uh, Part-time, another 12. <laughs> One of the, and that's trial and error, right? How many ISAs? Uh, ISAs, two ISAs, really, and seven staff. Seven staff. Like, people helping. So... Before we close up, does anybody have like a pressing question that like I need to ask this? Shout it out if you do. No? All right. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I get sticker shock against um, prepping for the home where it's like, you know, say it's between five and 12,000 to spruce up the kitchen or something like that. So what is what is your answer to that? Like if, if people, I mean, other, other than real vitamins, about 
typically when I'm doing that presentation, I'm giving them two prices. Here's the price if you do what, I, what I've recommended, and here's the price if you don't. And make it very clear that it's the best investment in their life to spend that 10 grand. Right? So I prepared two CMAs. Here's with the, with the updates, without the updates. There's a $100,000 difference. Do you want to spend the 10? The question is, is it a financial issue, right? Do they not have the 10,000 in equity or in the bank? Then revitalize, right? But for the most part, they're able to figure it out between their own financials and revitalize as long as there's a benefit, right? Would you, play, would you bet this 10,000 knowing that it's going to make you 90,000 profit? And make sure the numbers are accurate too, right? You don't want to sell them that and then it's same thing with managing expectations. Always have someone else look at it. I have our team cross-reference their CMAs. You know, just take a look at it. What do you think? What's your opinion? They ask me all the time, as experienced as they are, they ask me all the time, hey, what do you think of the price? Right? And that's my goal. My goal is to make them as, as best as I can, right? So, so that goes down to the, 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 the reason why we have low inventory, right? We have low inventory because... Time out. For, for the people who couldn't hear, why would I sell my house if I have a 3% interest rate to go out and get a 7% interest rate? I just want to make sure everybody understands the question. You always... Okay, you have to pause and not just blurb something without knowing, right? Sometimes saying that, let me research my options, and going back to the drawing board and asking other people in the office, and hey, what would you do? This is what I would do right? Find out what their level of motivation is, right? Why do they want to move, right? Do they, there's five kids in a three bedroom and they're miserable, <laughs> right? What's the need, right? The urgency. The second, leverage your lender for two things. One, what options out there is going to help me bridge this gap? Hey, we have a two, one buy down, okay? You're going from six and three quarters to four and three quarters for 12 months and five and three quarters the second year, right? S start to bridge that gap and make it where the value is worth the expense or the cost, right? Make it, it has to make sense to them. So I always leverage the lender for that. Uh, I lost my train of thought. So percentage, uh, Another thing, and sometimes it's not, it's all timing, right? They have to be ready. They, the newborn's just born, but when he turns like one, it, now they're ready, right? Whatever the reason is, timing is everything, right? I often help them prepare in advance. So hey, let's get your house ready. Let's take pictures. Let's do the video in the fall, right? And let's keep looking for that house because it's hard to find the house. Once we find that home, we can present an offer. Who agrees that it's easier to get a contingency deal accepted now? Yes. <laughs> now is the time. Oh, but the rates are 7%. Okay, so when they were three, there was zero chance your offer got accepted. And now there's a chance your offer gets accepted. <laughs> you have to make that decision, right? There was no chance before. So what good is that the rate is 3% if your offer is never going to get accepted because the demand is too high? Now you're in the house. So you're in the house you love, you're happy, you're living in it, right? That lifestyle, what is it that they're looking for, their urgency? And then paint that picture. And we've seen it on Instagram many times, right? If, if you're in the house and rates go down, what are you doing? Did you win? Yes. If rates go to 20% and you're locked at a seven, how do you, did you win? Yeah. If rates stay the same and eight years later you have 90,000 in equity, did you win? Yeah. Always use that rent versus own calculator. That's MBS Highway. Rent versus own. It shows your amortization. It shows you the curve, how your payment is con uh, consistent on a mortgage, but increasing on a rental. Right? You're paying 1900 now. I know I've raised all my tenants. Make sure they understand that and it makes sense. Right? And if it makes sense, and one thing that's key, guys, you're not going to get them all. You're not going to say this and, oh, my God, yes, sell my house. No. <laughs> it's a numbers game, right? Do whatever you can to improve your odds. 
improve your odds of converting that for sale by owner, improving your odds with generating business from your sphere, improve your odds in answering that question. Maybe it'll work one time out of 100. And guess what? That's another listing. It's a numbers game. So work daily on getting better and improving your odds in succeeding in this market, right? And we don't want to be part of that, that 30% that, that doesn't make it. Go ahead. Strategies for dual agent. This is going to be the last one. Okay. I don't really look at dual agent as, as an issue for a reason. I'm <clears throat> always looking out for the client's best interest. It's also dual agent if any Coldwell Banker agent is representing, right? Every listing that I've taken, I've never hosted an open house. The team does. They're the ones that are going to build a relationship with those buyers, not me. I'm getting out of production. That's my goal. Maybe not yours. That's fine. My goal is to get completely out of production one day and simply coach. Now, if you have, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought again. I'm just hungry. <laughs> and I'm sorry I'm doing this to you. So, so when, the offer, when the offers come in, I'm not looking at who they came from. We have an app we use. It's our own app that uh, uh, categorizes all the offers by amount, by down payment, by conventional terms. Everything's laid out. That's the click up form that you see on my listings. Everything's laid out. The obvious choices are there. These are the top three because not just price and terms, but uh, price and terms, but also financials. Not this one, FHA, with no appraisal waiver. This one's a little less, but full conventional and an appraisal waiver. Conventional is just strength in the application. Lower debt ratios, lower LTV. We're talking about odds, right? We're picking the best offer for the client. I know which are the three. And then I present them and they make the decision. On the buyer end, I manage that expectation also. Hey, they're not going to choose your offer because I'm making double commission. They're looking at what their bottom line is. I need your highest and best. How many times the team, hey, do you have, uh, yeah, highest and best. <laughs> you read the MLS? <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. And the day they have a problem with that, they won't be working with us anymore. Mm -hmm. Because customer first always, mm -hmm. no matter what. That's how you get paid long term, yeah. right? Building those relationships of trust. They won't ever question you again because they know you have their best interest. Right? Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Yeah, okay.